viewers welcome to this uh, episode of world ayurveda podcast uh, as all of you are aware uh, we are bringing to you candid informal and scholarly conversations with uh, global ambassadors of ayurveda uh, today we have two very special guests joining us from uh, uh, the caribbean islands uh, i will not waste much time in introducing them formally to our viewers and listeners uh, we have with us uh, madam suzy camelia roma she was born and raised in curacao and she studied civil law and criminal law at the university of groningen the netherlands after working as a faculty at the said university in 1984 she became a lawyer in 1986 she's held several uh, political functions namely as member of the island council of curacao member of parliament and minister of justice minister of economic affairs and two times prime minister of the then netherlands antilles between 92 to 2002 uh, during 13 years of absence in politics she held several board positions in the private sector and has served as a constitutional judge for st martin suzy returned to government in 2015 as the minister of transport traffic and infrastructure and was till recently that is till july 2020 she was the minister of health environment and nature of curacao with her we have a husband uh, mr carl camelia he is the principal founder and president of the university of maharishi for latin america and the caribbean short form being umlac they are also our global partners for the ayurveda day celebrations anchored by india foundation and supported by the ministry of ayush and iccr he has broad experience in the academic world including research uh, lecturing and administration uh, on the international level professor camelia has developed various international programs that has led successfully to european accreditation he has also developed and implemented several collaboration agreements with universities in the us in india spain latin america and the netherlands uh, in specific reference to him in the field of ayurveda he has published recently in the journal of integrative medicine of india a unique model for an integrative medicine curriculum of a medical degree program in which the students from day 1 will be trained in an integrative manner a warm welcome to both of you namaste first and foremost hope both of you are keeping well and safe thank, thank you. you namaste <coughs> i begin by asking each of you you could take turns in answering this i uh, will start with the lady first could you explain how ayurveda became a part of your life yes thank you um i began practicing tm maharishi tm and um by uh, the tm practice i was introduced into um ayurveda and at several occasions when i had health problems i used ayurveda and was cured so that's how i um, was introduced to ayurveda and what about you kal <laughs> so now <clears throat> as you know i am a teacher of the transcendental meditation of maharshi we say tm <clears throat> and uh, as a teacher of transcendental meditation in the late 70s early 80s maharshi started developing the knowledge of ayurveda for his his followers for our movement and as a teacher of transcendental meditation so i got the basic principles of ayurveda from arshi and it was so fascinating that um, uh, besides being a teacher i went more profound also in especially the theoretical um, philosophical aspects of of ayurveda from maharishi's approach that's how it came into my life I think you've given a hint to my next question, uh, which is, uh, who are your spiritual gurus? 
uh, is there an indian tradition that uh, both of you practice or have taken to would you like to elaborate you know here in in, in curacao in the west we don't we don't speak of of guru in the traditional way of 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 india but i understand your question right. in that sense <laughs> we will say that um, uh, i have been taught the transcendental meditation and the whole vedic knowledge of india by by maharshi mahesh yogi in that sense i say he is our our master you would say in the in india but here we would say um, from him i got all that knowledge and so I, so and that's why we have great respect for his profound insight in the vedic literature in the vedic science so we can say that from him he is my source of wisdom uh, ma'am you want to add how what particular aspect of uh, uh, maharishi mahesh yogi ji has inspired you to take to him well the practice of um, transcendental meditation okay. which i find um, very um, uh, it gives you a great advantage and i also follow the advanced techniques like the siri program and right. i find it, it's a very good um, let's say balance of life right uh, i'm going to come to transcendental meditation in a detailed manner a little later uh, both of you have taken very steel willed efforts to enable the knowledge of uh, complementary and alternative medicine uh, in curacao and the countries that you travel to through the international ayurveda congresses that maharishi organizes etc uh, i want to specifically ask you how are you enabling the knowledge of ayurveda uh, in your own context within the island of curacao what is the acceptance what is the feedback that you get well um when i was minister of health till recently i in um, work on introducing ayurveda uh, together with the traditional complementary and integrative medicine in the country's healthcare system mm -hmm. as part of the wellness approach so the inclusion of ayurveda in our healthcare system has been developed by me um, using guidelines of the world health um, organization for the regulation of products practitioners and practice and the legal formalization of such is in its final stages all you are in more you know giving emphasis to it in from the academia side i see you writing a lot and the university vision is that could you throw light as to from the academia in both in south america and in caribbean how are you enabling this knowledge of ayurveda to be interspersed within the field of academia yes yeah, so um, first <clears throat> it's important to mention our approach we strongly believe in an integrative um, approach that we have to integrate ayurveda in the mainstream medicine um, western medicine because if we don't speak the language of the western medicine they will not listen to us and they will not understand us that's why we have been working in integrating western medicine modern medicine together with with ayurveda and i must say we have been very successful with it when we approach other universities that they can understand what we are speaking in that sense like you say for us also research is very is very important because it's only by research that they will accept anything in the in the west otherwise it's just philosophy it's not what they call scientific and we may say that we have established the university of maharishi for latin america and the caribbean in order to promote ayurveda from the approach of maharshi uh, maharshi has yogi to the latin america and the way that we are doing it is especially 
signing collaboration agreement with universities in other countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, so that we can start offering the, the, the courses right away. And because our university is completely um, recognized for um, his, his degrees by the government, the Ministry of Education, so those universities are very interested in working with us because they can offer to their students an international um, uh, degree in something very unique, that is um, the integrative medicine, integrating Maharishi's approach to Ayurveda with Western medicine. That is how we are approaching the introduction of Ayurveda in Latin America and the Caribbean. Both of you have highlighted uh, how important is political will necessary as well as how important is research from an academic point of view. I'll shift gears a little in perhaps uh, inquiring about, I mean, if you look at Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, uh, the, the manner in which he took the tenets of spirituality and several thoughts of uh, India to the globe so effortl effortlessly, he made it a people's movement. And that's why there is so much resonance today across the globe. How do you think Ayurveda can become a people's movement? Does it have it in it to become a people's movement? Yes, of, of course, <clears throat> because it is the same um, approach that is taking place now with Ayurveda. From the Mauritius organization, we have the same approach, and that is um, uh, based on scientific research, bringing the, the knowledge in a language that people can understand. It was Mauritius' great virtue that he knew how to take this very profound wisdom of the Vedas, of the Vedic science of India, and translate it in its core to people that can understand it. And very important is also the, the subjective experience. For example, with Transcendental Meditation, besides the scientific research, everybody can experience what we are proclaiming. It's not just a philosophy. That is a, a profound technique that you do feel that level of, of, of consciousness, that transcendental level of consciousness, where the Vedas speak of, that they say that is the source of life, that is the ultimate goal of life. So we can experience it also. Now, the same thing is now with Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we do scientific research so that we can um, uh, convince and explain to the world what it is. But on the other hand, Everybody should be able to practice all the aspects of Ayurveda and see for themselves the subjective benefits. So that both approach is what we are doing and it has been very successful in our Mauritius approach. Ma'am, I'll come to you. You referred to this code word called TM. For the benefit of our viewers and listeners, TM refers to Transcendental Meditation, for which uh, Maharishi movement was best known. Um, are you integrating both TM and Ayurveda in your practice? What benefits have you seen of such a system? Yes, if it's uh, 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 towards my person, I have seen uh, better health, much tranquility. You are very balanced. People ask me many times when the political times are rough. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I remain in such a state of, uh, let's say, I'm very restful, mm -hmm. how can I do that? And I explained to them that that's due to the transcendental meditation, that I remain very calm, because in the center of a storm, you still can meditate and you have a bigger view of everything that is happening. So um, basically, the practice of TM and Siddha have um, given me much calm and strength to handle everything else in life. Carl, would you want to add to that? 
Oh, oh yes, <laughs> yes, like she said, on the one hand, so and TM is very practical because uh -huh. what you experience during the transcendental meditation technique is that you experience a level of rest that is much deeper than sleep. Uh -huh. And uh, this is in a very natural way. You don't need to do any effort through it because it's just a natural technique. Maharishi used to say that in India, it was a misconception that people thought that meditation is something very difficult and it, is, you know, it takes effort to do it and to concentration. And that's why he said he went to the West because um, uh, he should correct this vision that meditation is something practical on the one hand and on the other hand it's very easy because it's natural now with this also in my personal experiences in working at the university i am known as someone who are doing a lot of things together i'm doing a lot and all of that is possible because the meditation gives you the ability to focus sharply on what you're doing but still not losing the broad comprehension because you are broadening your consciousness, your awareness. And this broadening of awareness will lead to such a development that you can develop what the, in the Vedas they say is um, samadhi. So that cosmic consciousness that is that in an, an unlimited, um, unbounded level of consciousness where we can comprehend all the aspects of natural law, of nature, that can support us in everything that we do. Because very short, also to, to, to comment on this aspect, it is not only the practical benefit of being calm and having much rest and more energy that makes me practice it regularly, but the other thing that is what is called the support of nature, that, that, that Atman, that will take over in your life. It will organize the things. And that means that you yourself can just go with the flow and nature is taking over and organizing everything that you are doing. Even though I cannot say that I am an enlightened person, but I must say for 80%, 90%, things are going in a natural way. In, uh, in my life and everything that I do. And this for me is the very great benefit to, of practicing TM, that things will go much easier in life because you're acting in accordance with the, nature, the laws of nature. I'll come back to the, your field of action. Um, you are through the university, you're reaching to South America as well as uh, uh, Latin America, as well as uh, Caribbean countries. What is the position of uh, Ayurveda in these countries? If you are, if you have to give our viewers and listeners a quick uh, SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for Ayurveda in these two countries, basis your work so far. Okay, so you have taken the approach of a SWOT analysis. So my, that is my professional field as well. I am the business administration professor. So I did a lot of SWOT analysis in my life. But in this case, what we could say is the present situation is that in, uh, in many countries, you have small groups doing um, something with IFA. What we don't have yet is an approach where we have the governments um, uh, taking over um, uh, this, this knowledge. And, uh, um, and in this regard, we must say that with our university, we are developing very fast. For example, two, two years ago, the government of, of, of Brazil in Rio de Janeiro, they organized in a, a congress on integrative medicine and Ayurveda for, mind you, 4,000 participants. So Madam Minister was actually uh, a guest of honor. Mm. She did the inaugural address, but I was also a lecturer, a speaker in that conference. 
And there you could see that in uh, Latin America, people are, are very open to this knowledge. We almost see much um, uh, resemblance between India and, and South America and Central America. Even the people look like the same so, <laughs> sometimes you could say, but the whole knowledge that is how Maharishi started actually Ayurveda in Latin America. He went to Brazil and organized a big conference with the Indian experts of Ayurveda. You know, the, the, the late um, Triguna Ji, a very great expert of Ayurveda from India. He took also the Western um, uh, doctors the, 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 of, the, of the health of medical world and together with the native people with the traditional knowledge of natural medicine in, uh, in, in Brazil. So they did a Congress and that became the basis of the development. For, for example, just quickly, you can see that in Brazil, two important things are happening. One thing is that um, uh, they made a comparison between the Brazilian herbs and the Ayurvedic herbs of India as a model for all countries that we can use actually the Ayurveda knowledge to, so to see what are the benefits of our own herbs. And on the other hand, we can say that the Brazilian government, for example, already has acknowledged, has recognized in their official policy of health, 29 different systems of alternative medicine. Right. So here people are much more open to this. And with our specific University of Mauritius for Latin America and the Caribbean, all the countries that we visit, all the universities that we visit, we get instantly their interest and they want to start giving our um, uh, courses. Right now, we have um, a course that is a, a postgraduate for people who have some basis already in, in, in health. And this, we have a couple of hundred people um, following this course now online because of the COVID that we have to do it online. So we see that in Latin America, the strength is that people are open to this knowledge. The strength is that many organizations are doing something but that we have our university that is present in all the countries but that has a more global approach to bring it for everybody on different levels, basic level and the more professional level. That is the situation. So we can say that we have huge opportunities that very soon we can see Ayurveda very well spread through whole Latin America and the Caribbean. Fantastic and noteworthy. Ma'am, just to sign off on this question, uh, could you throw a brief light on the political class again and the policy makers? How do you find it? Are they uh, equally receptive? Or do, have you so, instituted any track to mechanism to get the political class together to accept it or at least start discussing it from a comparative perspective? Yes, um, you must know in Curacao, um, maybe 20, 30 years ago already, um, people were um, agreeing to the benefits of um, TCIM, natural medicine, Ayurveda. Right. So um, the government already organized um, like a department to develop the TCIM. Later on, it was um, stalled a little bit because you always have the discussion between um, the Western medicine and the TCIM medicine. But when I became minister, I went back to the Council of Ministers and they approved the development um, of such a department within our system. And they approved that we develop the TCIM, including Ayurveda within as one of the forms. So we started to develop this and it has a great many supporters, but of course it also has its adversaries. So let's say it's a topic that on one side you feel within the people itself, 
Um, also, uh, a good deal of the politicians, they are in agreement, but then let's say the Western doctors, they fight it very heavy. But still, we must just continue to go on because um, it will be approved by um, most people anyway. In uh, what form and means are you working with the Ministry of Ayush uh, and the Government of India, especially in collaborating towards the approach of bringing this vision of integrative medicine to the reach of the populace of Kurasao in particular and the countries that you are reaching through your university? Yes, we visited India last year and this uh, year in february oh yes in this <coughs> year in february and they we had a proposal for a memorandum of understanding with the um, indian government especially with the ministry of ayush and um, this proposal i brought to the council of minister and in our system of course it has to have all the um, let's say the advices from experts but it's um, in the process um, of government to have its uh, approval to be able to work with the Ministry of Ayush on several projects and programs so that Curacao and uh, India can have an agreement together. Yes, and then from the level of the, of the university, so we have visited in India a couple of times. Besides Ayush, we have in a collaboration agreement with three different universities in India because what they feel that is a benefit of working with us is that we have succeeded in integrating Western medicine together with Ayurveda in one curriculum of the doctors because normally those two are always fighting saying that we are the best and they are saying they are the best but people are more and more seeing that no we should have the way of bringing them together and that we have such a curriculum already is interesting to them. Now, the Ministry of, of Ayush, um, uh, the Secretary General, Mr. Kutaj, said literally, um, uh, Dr. Camellia, we know of your efforts of developing Ayurveda and we appreciate and we are following your steps, what you are doing. And so um, uh, they proposed um, uh, two, two things for us. One that was for a collaboration and research that we could work together. And uh, also very concrete, the Ministry of Ayush offered to organize a Congress in the Caribbean on Ayurveda and integrative medicine and to organize it in Curacao in order to bring together all the people that are interested or involved in their profession with Ayurveda. But it is because of the, of the COVID that those plans did not go on. And then there is a last thing that I want to mention. And also we have spoken to your department that recognizes medical um, uh, programs, medical programs of universities and they agreed to, for us to make the proposal so that the government of India will recognize our Ayurveda programs for people that are studying in India. If they do our programs when they graduate, they will be officially recognized in India as having done the Ayurvedic program. Lovely. Um... We'll go to the future now. The United Nations uh, has elucidated the Sustainable Development Goals uh, that they would like to envision and look at societies in a particular way by 2030. Uh, India's Prime Minister too has uh, given a clarion call of envisioning India in a particular way by 2030. What I would like to specifically ask both of you is that what would you say is the future of Ayurveda in the next 10 years? So Ayurveda in 2030, where do you see it going? Well, I think that Ayurveda will become much more known in the Western world 
because of the aspect of, um, let's say it's very, um, um, it, it's directed towards wellness and it's very much a prevention. Actually, it's a lifestyle in which you can um, be very healthy, live to uh, old age, still being flexible, have a clear mind. So I think that people will start seeing the benefits of Ayurveda as a um, comprehensive, a holistic lifestyle. And that in itself will push it towards the educational system to people to understand all the different aspects of life, not only the body, but mentally, spiritually. So I think it has a great future by um, uh, continuing to make people aware of Ayurveda. In that sense, I think that the Ministry of Ayush is doing great work, work toward the world, throughout the world. Tal? Yes. Now, um, uh, actually, if we take Ayurveda in its, in its full knowledge, then Ayurveda is actually um, a perfect science, a perfect knowledge of life. Yeah. And because it's, it's so complete, people cannot go without it. And that means that with uh, the efforts that you, Dr. Sudarshan, are doing with your team, with um, uh, Ritika and all the others that are helping you in coordination and collaboration with the Ministry of Ayush, I think that um, uh, we have now also from India an angle to promote Ayurveda to enter in the mainstream of health approaches in, in the West. I must say that when Marsha Mashiogi started with Ayurveda in 1980, no one was talking about Ayurveda. <laughs> yes, even in India, people, it was, Ayurveda was something, okay, for the simple people are doing Ayurveda, but it's not really medicine, you see. And so now, Maharishi has managed and uh, to, to, to get to put Ayurveda in the mainstream the development. And we have even the World Health Organization that is now um, uh, promoting um, Ayurveda together with other traditional complementary and integrative medicine. And so in 10 years, we can say that we will be very far because the, those who are still opposing they are losing the battle, if we can call it a battle. They are losing the battle because Ayurveda speaks for itself. And uh, it's researchers, you know, for example, let me just tell you something. You know what they managed? They have managed to get so far to say that researches done by Ayurveda in India does not count as scientific research. Mm -hmm. Can you manage just because most researches have been done in India. And then they will say, okay, no, we don't accept them. We must come with research in the West. And that is why we, from the Marshi perspective, but also other universities, and that we acknowledge them, their, their work as well, we are providing those scientific bases in order to, 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 to recognize them. But with the COVID, there is something new has happened and it is that actually COVID is much more something of prevention than from cure. Right. Don't even have the, the cure yet. So, and prevention, that is the core business of Ayurveda. So an Ayurvedic lifestyle will naturally prevent us of falling sick and falling in things like COVID. I see great perspectives for Ayurveda in the future. Uh, thanks for that positive uh, reassurance. Uh, one final question before I go into some quick one-word answers. Uh, yes, broadly agree. Five thousand years of contemporary, five thousand years of the health science. People are beginning to contemporize it. But uh, how do we make it relevant for the millennials and the youth? How do we creatively uh, take Ayurveda to the youth? Are there any tried and tested ideas that you would like to broach? 
Yes, yes, I'm an educator. That's the first thing that I will think is we should include in our education, education of health, education of personal health. We don't have that in education. We want to teach people of things outside themselves, but not of the, the self-development that the Vedic science is, is, is talking about. So we have to teach the youth and their education how to develop their, their, their own consciousness so that they will become enlightened, that they will, will go in life with a total consciousness developed and a total view on the world. In this sense, also, then, Ayurveda will be part of it because I, the, the teachings of Ayurveda can then naturally be brought to the children in the primary education, to the more, the more advanced ones in secondary education, etc. That means that when the students are graduated in high school, they have naturally, they know how to live a healthy lifestyle. So education is key. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask one word answers to uh, wind up this conversation. Uh, we'll start with ma'am, of course. Uh, how would you describe Ayurveda in one word? Wellness. Uh, <laughs> India as a civilization in one word. Amazing. Amazing. What, what is the Ayurvedic practice that you would recommend to our viewers and listeners to practice and imbibe? Meditation, transcendental meditation. Transcendental. <laughs> and what is the most uh, authentic place for Ayurveda that one can experience, according to you? Yeah. <laughs> India. India. Uh, I'll shift to Carl. Uh, I hope the answers would be different. <laughs> so I will do my best. <laughs> one word to describe Ayurveda. Perfection. Uh, to describe India as a civilization. Wisdom. Uh, what is the one Ayurvedic practice that you would like and urge our viewers and listeners to follow? Well, there I must <laughs> be with uh, with her. The Transcendental meditation as the as the basis of consciousness of whole Ayurveda. Right. And um, I think this too you would be with her, but we'll put this to you as well, the authentic place to experience Ayurveda. Actually, you would say that, that then let me differ a little bit, say the whole world. Because oh, right. Ayurveda is for the whole world. <laughs> Ayurveda is for the whole world and that's precisely the intent of this World Ayurveda podcast to interact with these global ambassadors. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing your invaluable, for sparing your invaluable time, uh, speaking to us so candidly about your experience. There's nothing like listening and imbibing from grassroots leaders and academicians like both yourselves. Uh, I'm sure our viewers and listeners will take back so much, uh, reflect and come back with some great feedback for this particular episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a very great pleasure. And we want to again congratulate you with this initiative of coordinating this world event of promoting Ayurveda towards Ayurveda Day. And May in, I want to finish saying May in 2030, Ayurveda will be recognized by all governments and will be the principal means of health education and health promotion in our, our life. Jai Gurudev. <laughs>